I was preparing for an interview one morning in February 2020. That interview was for a documentary that me and my team at Translash were producing called The Future of Trans. It's a fundamentally hopeful piece about what's ahead for trans people, what we can actually look forward to. As I was waiting for all of that to start, I do what I normally do. I was watching and scrolling through the news. Yeah, I do that. Try not to judge me, because it's my job. And that's when I caught a glimpse, a glimpse of a potentially darker future in store for trans people. And that came in the form of a bill. And it was an anti-trans bill in Idaho. A lawmaker now introducing a bill that would ban transgender girls from playing on girls' high school and college sports teams. It was the second piece of hateful legislation that year. And I thought to myself, this has to be coming from somewhere. I want to find out where and what's going on. We wrapped up shooting the documentary two weeks later. And before I knew it, before we all knew it, COVID was upon us. Everything had shut down. And more and more anti-trans bills were popping up in state houses all across the country. We were facing more than one epidemic. So I pressed my team to keep going after the story. And we started making calls. I talked to experts and activists, many of them my friends, to ask what's happening and why now? They told me, girl, keep digging. So I did. To be honest, I got a little obsessed. And a year after following my gut, I am reeling from what we learned. The truth is that an enormous network of political action groups, billionaires, and religious extremists have all come together to form an operation that most of us have never heard of. Their goal is to use trans rights as a way to push a larger, crueler vision of the country. Now, you might not have heard of them, but we're all feeling the impact of their operation. More than 100 anti-trans bills have been introduced in over 30 state houses this year. And this anti-trans hate machine is just getting started. My name is Amara Jones. I'm a Black trans woman, a journalist, and the founder of Translash Media. Welcome to the anti-trans hate machine, a plot against equality. Now, I know that all of this sounds like something out of a comic book or science fiction. Like I'm describing Hydra from the Marvel world or the rise of the Sith and Darth Vader in Star Wars. But there's more to this story than a conspiracy of frightening organizations hiding in plain sight. At the center of this are so many brave trans people. They're fighting all over the country. Even trans children are facing off against this machine. Their collective courage and the power of their humanity is the only thing which makes me feel hope that this machine can be stopped and disassembled. Let's start this story in a place where it began for me, Idaho. Idaho is where the anti-trans sports bills really gain traction. And it's the place where we have to go if we're going to understand a key part of the anti-trans hate machine. Come with me to Boise, March 2020. We on? We're on. Lawmakers have gathered for yet another hearing on a bill to bar trans girls from sports. It's called HB 500. I'd like to call a Senate State Affairs Committee to order. We're a little... The bill's sponsor is there. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I am Barbara Ehart, representative from District 33, which is Idle Falls. And Madam Chairman, good committee, truly, I am grateful that you are allowing uh, myself to come before you to present this bill, which is incredibly necessary. Um, if I may, let me make it very clear that this bill is about one thing. It is about protecting opportunities and continued opportunities for girls and women in sports. Every girl deserves the chance to pursue her dreams, to excel in athletics. Forcing girls and women to compete against biological boys and men has often made us spectators in our own sport. What strikes me watching this is that she's passionate and she totally buys into this nonsense. So much so she names her bill the Fairness in Women's Sports Act. But there's someone else testifying at this hearing too. A teenage girl. She's got 
blonde ringlets and is wearing her high school cross-country t-shirt. She's super nervous. If you could not guess already, I am in fact a transgender girl and an athlete. I ran cross-country and track in high school. This issue is so important to me because running is such a core part of who I am. It keeps me fit. It keeps me motivated in life in general. It keeps me alive. Her name is Lindsay Hecox. She's a college first year. She's one of the bravest, most earnest young people I've ever seen. It's the first day she'll face off against the anti-trans hate machine. She doesn't know it yet, but this is just the start of a long fight. Lindsay came to Idaho from California to go to college and to live as the young woman she always knew she was. And a big part of her dream was to run alongside other women on the cross-country team. Lindsay had started to transition in the summer between high school and college. Can you talk a little bit about why you wanted to join the team? Running by yourself isn't as fun as running with a team, especially with friends, and you both push each other to be the best athlete possible. I was missing that aspect, especially since I didn't really have the full experience, so to speak. I was pretending to be someone I wasn't in high school. It was just kind of sad to me that I never did it as Lindsay. Now, I've spent hours talking to Lindsay, and what sticks with me after every conversation is just how pure and simple her motivations are. She just wants to run and feel good about her body and have friends. Who's opposed to that? And why would banning girls like Lindsay be a hill that lawmakers want to die on? Especially when the entire premise of the bill is founded on assumptions that aren't based in any kind of evidence at all. Now, I know this is going to be a little wonky, but the people whose job it is to look at the science and decide what's fair say that once trans women reach the same hormone levels as cis women, that there's no difference in athletic performance. The National Collegiate Athletic Association, USA Track and Field, and the International Olympic Committee all say that trans women can compete and that it doesn't hurt cis women. So it's not surprising that a lot of lawmakers in Idaho had concerns about HB 500. I would ask that we vote against this. It is singling out folks and putting them on the margin even farther. And that, that's just not the Idaho way, at least I hope not. Moreover, people in Idaho weren't clamoring for anti-trans laws. Richie Epink is with the ACLU of Idaho, and he says many Idahoans were deeply uncomfortable with the legislation. Idaho's largest employers, Chobani, HP, Micron, Cliff Bar, came out against the bill. Idaho doctors, Idaho counselors, Idaho School Boards Association, students, including student athletes in Idaho, they were all calling the governor's office. They were all urging the governor to veto this bill. Richie says it just didn't make sense that the bill was still moving through the state legislature. It can't be explained by what Idahoans want or by problems in Idaho. It's something else. There was something bigger at work here than the voices of the people of Idaho. There had to be. Because even the Idaho Attorney General had issued a formal opinion to say that HB 500 is likely to be found unconstitutional by the courts. So from wavering lawmakers to corporations to citizens to the state's Attorney General, all were saying, slow down, don't do this. But the sponsor of the bill, Representative Barbara E. Hart and her allies were determined to ram it through. Her co-sponsor in the Senate began reassuring lawmakers that there's no reason to worry about the fallout because Richie was right. There was something else going on. I do want you to know that there is a third party group that has been working with us on this bill and will be responsible for any legal defense fees. And this third party group stayed involved and helped get the word out about it. With this push, HB 500 passes. Governor Brad Little signs it less than a month after Lindsay Hecox stood up and told her story at the state capitol. However, the passage of the Fairness in Women's Sports Act raised an important question. Who is this outside group who helped push the bill over the finish line? So 
my team and I started reaching out to Barbara Ehart, the person behind the bill, because she would know. We called, we sent emails, and we left voice messages. We even slid into her DMs. Yeah, I know. But I had to have an answer. Then one day, we tried calling her again. For what I thought was the last chance. It was a long shot. But this time she picks up and says, sure, I'll talk to you. Um, Representative Earhart? Ehart, uh-huh. Ehart. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I didn't know how much time I was going to have, so I jump right in. And I ask her, who helped you? As you ask that question, can I give a little bit longer I th- answer? I think that, that we... Okay? No, I think that we want to hear as fulsome of an answer on each of the questions okay. that I have. So I would encourage you to stretch your legs if you if you wanted to do that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I set forth trying to figure out how to how to do this. Just kept hitting roadblocks and had reached out to quite a few pro family groups and literally they were telling me we couldn't go forward. Let me unpack how this normally works. When A state lawmaker wants to draft a bill, especially a relatively new lawmaker like Barbara, they rely on their staff. They rely on their legislative services office, or they reach out to nonprofits in their state for help. But Barbara made a beeline to national conservative organizations outside of Idaho for help. I felt kind of like I'd hit an impasse, and that's actually when I had reached out to Alliance Defending Freedom. Well, at least now, we had the name of that outside group, Alliance Defending Freedom, or as they're commonly known, ADF. So Barbara says she tells them that she wants to ban trans girls from sports in Idaho and needs their help. ADF says, yes, we can do this. And then they decided that they were going to get more serious about this legislation. And then we completely changed it. And this is where you see what, of course, many are using now in these other states. As I'm hearing this, I'm really glad that Barbara can't see my face because it's totally cracked. And everybody who knows me knows I can't mask my surprise. We've been investigating how the anti-trans hate machine works for months. And within minutes, she's just told me about a big piece of the whole plan. She's saying that ADF not only basically wrote the Idaho bill, but that it's become the prototype for all of those other anti-trans sports bills that are popping up all over the country. Now, my jaw is also on the floor because ADF likes to mask its role. We reached out to them multiple times, like multiple, and no one would talk to us. They're basically the legal arm of the entire right-wing Christian values movement in this country. They want an extreme interpretation of the Bible to be enshrined in every aspect of American law. In their drive to do so, ADF goes far beyond the traditional Christian fundamentalism that you might have heard of, well, all your entire life. This is not your grandmother's Christian fundamentalism. This is way beyond that. In fact, the Southern Poverty Law Center has designated ADF as a hate group. That puts ADF, with its innocuous sounding name, Alliance of Hidden Freedom, in the same category as the Ku Klux Klan and neo-Nazis. ADF's extremist hate is particularly directed at LGBTQ people, but rather than burning crosses or carrying tiki torches, they weaponize the law. How do they do it? They sue governments claiming religious liberty as a reason to discriminate. And y'all should know that they've been highly effective, taking big name cases like Masterpiece Cake Shop and Hobby Lobby all the way to the Supreme Court and winning them. They also pushed state legislatures to legalize discrimination. ADF wrote the model bathroom bill that a bunch of states used in 2016 to try to tell trans people where to pee. Now they're pushing model legislation, sound familiar, to ban trans people from playing sports. The anti-trans hate machine just keeps doing the same thing over and over. We cannot continue to pretend that allowing males to compete in the girls' category does anything less than spell the end of women's sports. That's Chrissy DeHolcom. She's a lawyer with ADF and a leading architect of their strategy. 
Regardless of where we stand on a variety of issues, I hope we can all agree that turning women's sports into a co-ed free for all simply is not a plausible solution for the cultural and the social challenges that we're addressing. When our schools and our society tries to ignore biological reality, people get hurt. Girls get hurt. But ADF is trying to hurt girls. Girls like Lindsay Hecox. Even though Idaho's HB 500 has passed into law, Lindsay keeps doing her part. She keeps speaking out and keeps going to protest. At the same time, activists in her circle start working on a plan to bring a lawsuit. They want to hold the state accountable for discriminating against trans girls. In the latest sign of her bravery, Lindsay raises her hand to be the sole plaintiff in the case. And there's a part of this where it seems like your motivation to get involved was truly self-directed. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that overall, and if there was a specific moment where you were like, I have to do something. I don't really feel like there was much of a choice in the matter. I, I guess I could have potentially declined, but that would have felt terrible for me. I, I wanted to do something for my community, and this is a huge thing, like most Trans people never get the opportunity to fight anti-trans politicians in legislature. So I don't know why would I why would I turn it down? Lindsay's this young woman who just wants to run and be one of the girls. But here she is, putting her life on the line and standing up because it's the right thing to do. She doesn't want anyone else to have to endure this, and it's a profound thing to witness. On July 22nd, 2020, Lindsay faced off against the state of Idaho in court. And the stakes couldn't be higher. This case is the first one in the nation fighting anti-trans sports legislation. This lawsuit is about whether trans girls have the right to thrive. Good morning, everyone. We are live from the federal courthouse in Boise, and we are here with our plaintiff, Lindsay. We're so excited to be here in solidarity this morning. Supporters were outside cheering her on. They knew what she was up against. We see you. We hear you. We love you. Go, Lindsay! And then the four-hour hearing starts. Around 40 people sit in the courtroom all masked up. Among them, lawyers from Alliance Defending Freedom, the group that helped Barbara and her colleagues with HB 500. ADF had promised lawmakers that they would help defend it in court, And here they are today, keeping their word, bringing the full force of the anti-trans hate machine up against Lindsay. During the proceeding, the ADF lawyers are totally dismissive of her journey and who she is. They repeatedly and intentionally call her and other young trans women biological males. And they're nasty about it. But Lindsay was told by her lawyers to prepare for this kind of thing. During the hearing, she's ready because the slurs from ADF could come at any moment without warning. I kind of just like made my vision blurry and was hearing the testimony by the opposing side, but was kind of letting it roll by very quickly. I was definitely trying to make sure that whatever was said didn't get through whatever barrier I set up so I wouldn't feel actually very hurt. But after that first hearing, ADF suffered a setback. The judge issues a preliminary injunction against the legislation. That means Idaho's ban on young women like Lindsay playing sports can't be implemented. In an uncommon 87-page decision, that judge says that the Fairness in Women's Sports Act is actually unfair. He essentially calls it a solution in search of a problem, and one that's probably unconstitutional, too. The aspect of it coming from a Trump-appointed judge was kind of lost on me at that moment, but this came from someone who might have been opposed to trans rights and still happened. So I definitely think that today I have more pride that we won that injunction At the beginning, I didn't realize how important it would be for the rest of the case. Right away, the ADF, not surprisingly, and the state of Idaho challenged this win for Lindsay, 
So in May 2021, there's a second hearing in the case. It's in front of a three-judge panel on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. May it please the court? It happens virtually over Zoom. Like most court proceedings, this new hearing is dry. A bit of a snooze fest, if one is totally honest about it. But at the end of it is something explosive. It's so unusual, and it shows the depth of ADF's power. The state gets to go last to make their final rebuttal. Uh, It's the last thing that the court hears before the court makes a decision sometime down the road. This is Richie Epping again, Lindsay's lawyer with the ACLU of Idaho. I've never seen this happen before. The state waived their time on rebuttal and gave it to ADF. So he's saying that the state of Idaho deferred to ADF, a private organization to defend the state's law HB 500. For me, it's symbolic. It shows that really it, it's it's ADF's priorities, it's ADF's ideologies that is driving this bill and the state's defense of it. So, I'm sorry, the state of Idaho <laughs> deferred to ADF to close out its argument in the appellate case on why their law is constitutional. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't, I've never heard about, I've never seen that happen before something like that. As of this publishing, the court has yet to decide whether to let Barbara E. Hart's law go into effect. But for ADF, this was never about just one state. With their support, lawmakers in more than 30 states have introduced legislation based on the one ADF wrote with Barbara in Idaho. In 2021 alone, at least nine states have joined in actually banning trans girls from sports. We, I knew from the beginning that this is this was the kind of thing that would go through the court system. When I talked to Barbara, she essentially said that from the beginning, she thought that her bill had a shot to ban trans women from sports all across the country. Uh, one way or the other, we, we always knew this was the kind of thing that would be headed to the Supreme Court. You, you had a full expectation that you thought this could be litigated all the way up when you, when you wrote the bill. Absolutely, without any doubt, hesitation, or reservation, um, my expectation was it was going all the way. And she's not necessarily wrong. With a 6-3 conservative majority on the court, Barbara's bill could become the law of the land. Chase Trangio is the deputy director of transgender justice at the ACLU. He's been involved in every case that that organization has brought against the ADF's anti-trans sports bills. You know, what the other side is arguing for is a constitutional right to not have to share space with trans people. You know, to argue it violates their right to privacy, their right to equal protection, to have to be proximate to us. And if they succeed on that in these courts, if, if the Supreme Court one day holds that cis people have a constitutional right not to be proximate to trans people, then that can't be undone except by another Supreme Court case or a constitutional amendment on the U.S. Constitution. So we're talking generations. In all of this, Barbara has become a star on the right. From the beginning, ADF cultivated her ambition and drive. And now she's a lieutenant pushing anti-trans legislation nationally. How do you feel about having become a leader on this issue nationwide? And you've mentioned that you've testified in a couple of state legislators or other states. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering if you can just, you know, have us know where those are just so we can understand, like, where you've traveled and the breadth of your leadership on this. I traveled to uh, Montana and to South Dakota. Certainly, there's been Utah and Kansas and um, North Carolina and North Dakota. And um, I know I'm forgetting states. As a matter of fact, I need to go write some of this down. But (laughs) probably spoken with about 30 legislators from all across the United States, helping them as they prepped for this. So I'm happy to keep doing that because this issue, obviously, hopefully you can hear, I'm very passionate about. And right-wing groups across the country are taking notice. Most of the, of the uh, people with whom I've spoken before, in one way or another, had reached back to, to mm. say, oh, you know, we're, we're behind you, we're proud of you, we support you. 
All of this makes me realize just how effectively the anti-trans hate machine runs. Because what started in Idaho with Barbara and ADF has now grown into a sprawling national operation. But what you have to understand is that the push to get trans girls out of sports didn't start with Barbara in Idaho. If you ask Barbara or any lawmaker pushing these sports bills right now what evidence they have that trans girls in sports are actually a concern, they point to just one example. This first really kind of hit my radar where I <clears throat> was becoming more and more aware as I was watching what was happening in Connecticut. Here's the deal with Connecticut. Andrea Yearwood and Terry Miller were two Black trans girls running track in the state. Now, Andrea and Terry were talented athletes. But let's be honest, they weren't necessarily more or less talented than thousands of other young women. They played some in statewide races, but they lost some. Even so, there's been a titanic clash about whether they should be allowed to run. This clash is what captured Barbara's attention. And leading the charge there is, you guessed it, Alliance Defending Freedom. ADF sued the state of Connecticut in federal court for letting Terry and Andrea share a track with cis girls. Even though Terry and Andrea are no longer in high school, ADF is still pursuing it. You know, they're incredibly smart lawyers, which is frustrating to have people who are effective at what they do be so unbelievably cruel. That's Chase Strangio again from the ACLU. He's seen ADF's cruelty up close. We want to take very seriously <laughs> their work as adversaries in this because they're very good at it. And that's troubling. What's troubling is that even the idea that these two trans women ran on a team with cis women once upon a time is way too much for ADF. And it points to their extremism. But so does something else. Catherine West of Legal Voice is also litigating ADF's anti-trans legislation. She says this is a debate about women's body autonomy. Important. It is so important to stand up against these kinds of bills and laws because they're so interrelated to the ways that laws are passed to control women generally, to limit the decisions that women can make with their own bodies. When a group like ADF is coming after girls who are trans, they're coming after all women and girls. And they're going to be willing to sweep, sweep up all of us, all girls and women, in order to achieve what is their worldview or end goal. And this worldview is about using biological arguments to limit women's rights. This case is pitting trans girls and cis girls against each other, but it's actually an attack on all girls and women. However, there's another big part of this, and that's race. We cannot lose sight of the fact that this anti-trans sports movement began as a direct backlash to the mere presence of Terry and Andrea in track lanes with white girls in Connecticut. This means that anti-Blackness is a key part to understanding exactly how we got here. And you know what? That's not a surprise. Sports are often where the worst of America's past, both in terms of race and gender, collide. The examples are all around us. When white men like Michael Phelps are extraordinary athletes, no one even thinks twice about it. But when Black women, cis or trans, succeed, their very existence is interrogated. Competitors and officials wonder out loud if they have some unseen, outside, unfair, unknown advantage. And it's why Black women athletes are much more likely to be subjected to so-called sex verification testing than white women. We see this with Kasa Semenya, an Olympic runner from South Africa who was forced out of competition just because she had naturally high testosterone levels. And we see it, of course, with Serena Williams, whose very physique has become a symbol for some of her lack of womanhood. All of this is why Barbara and the rest of the anti-trans hate machine are playing right into history's hands. They are doubling down on the legacy of misogyny and racism that most of the country is actually trying to unwind. But Lindsay Hecox, 
who was a teenager when all of this started, understands what most people like Barbara don't. That it's impossible to hold some women back without actually holding all women back. And she's paying the price for standing up and for saying it. And it's why she sometimes fears for her physical safety. I was actually running in downtown Boise, or at least close to downtown, and some truck came by and the the person in it said, hey, F you. I just knew it was directed at me. But I remember that very clearly because I had my heart rate just uh, go two times as fast. Like my whole body was agitated after that. And Lindsay dropped out of school last year, working a job, being a full-time student, and taking on Barbara and the ADF was just all way too much. Still, Lindsay plans to return to Boise State next year. But even the way she talks about that, going back to school and trying out for the cross-country team, I hear her trying to shrink herself. One of the things you've said is that you don't necessarily want to be the best. And I'm wondering if you could just elaborate on that and why you mentioned that. And it's, I'm thinking about it in the context of you uh, trying out for the team again. So I don't feel like I want to be the fastest runner on the team just because, especially with the fact that people would assume I have some kind of an advantage. So I am perfectly fine with being in the middle of the pack or the bottom of the pack of my team, potentially. But one person not shrinking is Barbara. She's only grown in this fight. So I had to go back and ask her a big question that was still unanswered for me. Something told me that none of her previous answers told the whole story. Why did Barbara actually team up with ADF? And where in her framework for humanity does all of this fit? I'm wondering if you had ever listened to or heard the story of Lindsay Haycox, and if so, what your reaction was. And the reason why is, I'm going to say something, I know this is going to sound probably very strange to you, but what's fascinating to me is the remarkable similarity in the way that you all both speak about sports and the importance of sport and what it does for you and how it changes your life. That's a very fascinating thing for me to hear in both of your stories, even as you're on you know, opposite yeah. sides. You know what, what, um, you're the first person in all of these interviews to ask something like that. And that, that is, that is an intriguing question. And I, I, but, it, but it makes sense to me. It makes <laughs> sense that Lindsay would, Lindsay and myself would both feel the same way. Uh, probably just like anyone who just enjoys uh, the competition and and the sacrifice, uh, the conflict resolution, so many things that come mm-hmm. through sport. I want someone like Lindsay to be able to compete, uh, but you know, I just I just don't want Lindsay to be able to take away opportunities for girls and women. So thank you for pointing that out. It's something when you and I hang up, I'm going to probably ponder. Despite the fact that she's unleashed an entire legal apparatus against Lindsay, who was 18 at the start of all this, she's never even thought about what it's been like for Lindsay. Barbara is legislating against an entire group of people in a case she hopes will reach all the way to the Supreme Court. And their individual experiences have never even crossed her mind. I had to give her one more chance to explain. I'm just wondering if you've ever thought about this from their perspective. Like, if you ever thought, okay, so my body is totally different than the men's. My body has changed a lot from the medical interventions. So how on earth would someone like me, like because we're putting our sh- ourselves in that person's shoes, how in the world would they compete on a men's team they would experience it would seem to me some of the you know the disadvantages that you're talking about if they go on a track and try to compete with them there's no way they're going to win so i'm wondering if you'd ever considered thinking about it from from their perspective 
I actually am empathetic to the challenges um, that Lindsay has faced and will face, not just in sports, but in this life-changing decision. But Lindsay is making it as an adult. And, you know, I, I have to support the decision because Lindsay is an adult. And I think that's important that, you know, be supportive of that. But with that comes consequences, like I say, that we all don't get to have a say in. She's trying to play nice. But I hear something more ominous in all of this. Not only is she not considering the humanity of trans people, but she believes we deserve to be punished. Our very existence is the actual crime that she's legislating against. I talked to Lindsay recently to see how she was doing. She's sounding hopeful. I actually just saw someone at work today who was wearing a Boise State track and field shirt and I was asking her questions about how the team's doing and what events she was running. And it, that little encounter just made me want to be on the team so much more after kind of not having that enthusiasm for a while. Just seeing someone who is on the team, realizing I could be her friend potentially, it just boosted that feeling. Every time I talk to Lindsay, I'm just stunned by the fact that there is anyone, let alone an entire movement, that is trying to crush her. Or any other trans person, for that matter. And that movement is so much bigger than ADF. Next time, we're going to unveil one of the biggest and most influential parts of the anti-trans hate machine. Speaking up against injustice is the right thing to do, but when it's your kid, you're just your 16 year old kid who just wants to be a kid. So shame on any politician introducing these hateful, mean-spirited, and discriminatory bills that are anti-American. It's weird and scary. Biggest thing is that it's scary. This just shouldn't be legislated at all. All that and more next time on the Anti-Trans Hate Machine, A Plot Against Equality. This project is made possible with support from the New York Women's Foundation and the Heisig Simons Foundation. I'm Amari Jones, your host and executive producer. Oliver Ash Klein is our senior producer. Tyler Wilson, Annie Ning, Ruby Fazinski, Callie Wright, and Jay McAuliffe are our producers. Audrey Quinn is our editor. Sound design and mixing by Alexander Charles Adams. Montana Thomas is our production coordinator. Research from Sydney Bauer. Jillian Brandstetter and L Communications are in charge of press and outreach for this series. Our digital strategy is led by Daniela Capistrano of DCAP Media. Social media and production assistance by Yannick Ike Mirko. Graphic and social media support from Resistance Communications. Justin Klosko is our fact checker, and our intern is Jordan Marana. Our theme music was composed by Ben Draghi. Additional music courtesy of Lex Valena, Mo Rooney, Broke for Free, Dr. Dream Trip, and Alexander Charles Adams. Subscribe to the Anti-Trans Hate Machine, A Plot Against Equality, wherever you listen to your podcast, and be sure to tell all of your friends about our show. <laughs>